Well, can I start while the machine's being set up? It's, it's ready, ready to go. go. Fantastic. Uh, by, by joining with everybody else and thanking Joe for organising this event, uh, I'm, I'm uh, another one of the, I think they call them the Glenty's virgins, uh, who are here. I've been here actually for two days, so I, I'm kind of feeling more experienced than I was when I arrived. Uh, I have to say it's been fantastic. I've, I've heard so much about it, but actually when you're here, it's, it's, it's really something to be seen. Um, We've come through uh, four difficult years fiscally, uh, and we all know that. Uh, we've also come through, I think, three frustrating years of waiting for international progress and solutions. And I think we all felt a little bit better this afternoon when John Moran announced to us that we had had a successful return to the markets. It may have been a modest return to the markets, but it was a successful one. Um, and that's a sort of sign of, 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 of where we're at. But what do we need as a country? We need basically a restructuring and we need restructuring in terms of, I call debt, debt and competitive restructuring, reform of the public sector, economic reform, and also political reform. And we also need realism. And the realism is the one I want to just dwell on for a moment here. The kind of reform process we're talking about is going to go on for years and years and years. This is not get reform done and be done. There's no such thing as reform that gets done and is done. It's a continuous process. But John is right in saying we have to make sure that we're started on a robust path. But I think that notion, and it's true for businesses, it is true for government, it is not a, a constant landscape. So the reform agenda, in some sense, is an evolving agenda in the, in the years ahead. If I take the, the, the groups that I talked about and say we were talking about reform and restructuring, uh, as to, so far as the elements of, of, of our recovery are concerned. So I mentioned debt restructuring here, and by debt restructuring, I'm getting at the idea of of families restructuring, but also the country restructuring its debt. And obviously they're very different things, but they're both part of the process of economic recovery. In terms of competitive restructuring, I'm talking about you know, changing moving resources out of what was, was in, in, in construction and into, into newer industries, where, where, which, which we have if you like, some kind of competitive advantage in the future. And also, of course, reducing the scale of our, of our banking section, sector. In terms of the other three, which are the reform agendas, and I think it's important to, to sort of see the three of them coming together, and in a way the title of this, this, this session very much focused on the political reform and the public sector reform, but I want to argue throughout this that we need economic reform at the same time as we need public sector reform, that without economic reform it won't be as successful. So what do I mean by economic reform? I'm talking about reform that supports economic restructuring, uh, supports competitiveness, and is also associated with an efficient allocation of resources in the public sector. And the point I'm really wanting to make is that public sector reform of the type which is coming out of the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform is all very good stuff very important and has to happen. But if it doesn't happen hand in hand with economic reform, then we could end up actually delivering very efficiently things we don't need. Because the public sector reform agenda can actually do that. You can be managerially more efficient, administratively more efficient, use your IT more efficiently, but how do you know you're actually doing things the way, the way you need to do them? And I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, and then obviously political reform is something which I'm going to leave to Pat to talk about, but it seems to me that, that, and I'll mention this just at the end, I think it's very important that at the same time as the public sector is reforming, the political system is also reforming, because I think that means that the two people, are, two groups of people are actually in the same activity, that same sense of a shared agenda. It's different, but they're both going through a reform process. And it isn't about one blaming the other or the other blaming the one if it's going to be productive. Now, I put down those, if you just look, those five silos, but the point I suppose I want to make is that these five actually interconnect. And if I think about the, the last number of days here and some of the sessions, a lot of them have covered different parts of these, these spheres, these circles. But the reality is, is that for economic recovery, we actually require progress in all of these. And, and also, there's a sense in which at the interface between them, it's extremely important. So if you take, for example, the... the um, the one here, which is, is uh, political reform and debt restructuring, well, you know, our be the better of opinion of us international markets is part, at least, uh, a response to the fact that as a, as, as a policy, as, as a society, we are managed the transformation process well. We have retained our trust in, in, in the government that we now have to bring us through that. And I think that in turn reflects on people's willingness to lend to Ireland and the fact that there were so many new lenders today says something about a, a, create, a created effect on that side. If we take something like competitive restructuring and public sector reform, I think it plays to what John was talking about a moment ago, which is that you need an efficient public sector in order to have a competitive 
uh, economic structure for the rest of the economy, a competitive business sector, and that, in fact, supports restructuring and supports competitiveness. What I'm going to do is really to focus on, for the rest of the talk, because I've got a much longer paper, um, which, is, which will be available, but I'm just going to talk, really focus on the, on the intersection, if you like, between the public sector reform and the economic reform. And as I say, public sector reform, just to be clear, what I'm talking about here is, is what's coming out of the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform. There's 200 actions, there's 70 recommendations over 14 different areas. That's a huge agenda, I'm going to come back to it. Uh, and economic reform, of course, is being driven by the Troika and, and being driven by the Cabinet Subcommittee on, on Economic Recovery and Jobs. Um, and is, as I said, it's absolutely essential that we have economic reform to make sure we're delivering appropriately the things that we need. Now, the reality is that we're starting off in, in a, a, a space that is, is, is diff difficult fiscally. And before just turning to the fiscal issue, I just want to say that in the case of that, I had the arrow between the two circles, but actually what I see is the two overlapping. This is your little mini Venn diagrams that one had at school many years ago. But what I'm really trying to, to get at here is the fact that public sector reform and economic reform comes together. So let me just give you an example that's very current. The health sector. Okay, so we all know that the health sector is in deep trouble, and in particular the public sector part of it is in deep trouble with the HSE, not being able to meet its, its, its budget, etc. But if you're going to look for reform in the, public, in, in, in the health sector, there are two distinct things you need to do. You have to start with saying, how am I funding a health sector? And that's all about economics. That's about what is the funding model you have in place to remunerate doctors, what is the, the incentives that you're creating for people to go to the GP rather than a hospital, etc.? So if you just move people around and don't actually have a funding model underpinning it, then it isn't going to work. And similarly, with regard to financing, you need, you need that. So there are so many areas, but health is the most obvious one, where you need to know that at the same time as you're doing all the good stuff, the HR management, the better accounting systems, the better IT, etc., etc. You need to know where you're going with the health system with regard, with, regard to, with regard to funding. So this is just a table I just want to put up just to show you what we've done. I mean, the blue area is the, this is the 32 billion austerity package. That's the backdrop to everything. And as we know, it's, 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 we've gone as far at this stage. We're in 2012, which is the green area, and we're doing 3.8 billion this year. We've done the lion's share of it. We've done 20 billion of it already, which is, 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 is the blue. And it's very striking to note how much of it was done in 2009. I mean, that was the, really the very, very major, major, major adjustment. But we have this pink area still to go through if we're to meet these targets and assuming that they don't, don't change. We still have to meet these, these numbers in, in, in the next three years. And I suppose my argument really is that if we're to do this without damaging the economy and without damaging the public sector further, we need to do reform. We can't just simply do salami slicing and cutting back on, on numbers. It must, be more, it must be stronger than that. And that's really why the reform agenda is so important. So what does successful reform, reform, reform require? It requires, as I said already, that it's continuous and it's not big bang. People I know who are very experienced in, in higher education reform internationally and in health reform internationally all point to the fact that the big bangs don't work. The dramatic big structural changes don't actually deliver on the day. The successful countries are the ones who, who have a strategic direction and increment slowly. And I know John wants us to go very fast, but the reality is getting it slowly and incrementally right and staying with it, the sustainable piece, which I agree with him on, is absolutely central. In today's world, since people are paying taxes and are under a very difficult situation, it has to be user-centered. And user-centered very often means a lot of mundane items that actually don't make the news, aren't going to be covered by the media, but in fact are actually vital to deliver an improved service to the people who are out there. And I think that's a real difficulty for the government at the moment. It's a real difficulty for public expenditure and reform. They list all these things. They're not going to get any you know, taxpayer payer sitting up in bed really excited about what they're doing, but actually to make their lives better, that's what's needed. It has to be focused on reducing inefficiencies, and I suppose there's two kind of inefficiencies here. There's the ones we all see, which is the road being dug up that was resurfaced a few months ago, uh, the waste of empty buses running on routes all the time, these kind of things that, 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 that the consumer sees and the user sees, and it's actually very offensive in, 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 in the current environment. And it's, but it's also the type of hidden inefficiencies which economists worry about, 
the fact that, that, that you know, we want to increase uh, day patient rates for hospitals uh, so that people aren't actually staying overnight. Yet the hospitals themselves have an incentive to get you in overnight because then they get money for the bed either from the government or from the VHI or whichever the insurance company is. So there's a whole set of perverse incentives there. And then the final one is, is around rebuilding, rebuilding trust. And I put at the bottom here, it's not just a public sector issue. There's a lot of organizations, and the banks obviously come to mind, which also need to rebuild trust and actually face the same kind of reform agenda as, as, the, as, the, as the public sector does. So if we combine the public sector reform and economic reform, what does that actually mean? Well, for me, it means starting at the correct point of the analysis. Now, you hear words all the time in the public, public sector agenda of we want to outsource more, more shared services, privatization, all these words. I think we need to start, stand back a little bit and say, let's consider in each case what it is we need. We shouldn't be driven by the past, driven by ideology, driven by flavor of the month, or fashion as to what it is out there. We look at it coldly on an evidence base and do it on that, on that side. For that, we need more, more system, system, systematic uh, use of evidence in terms of what we do. And Ireland is very weak in that, extremely weak. And I, I have examples in the paper from the health sector and the higher education sector, which will show you how weak that, that, that that structure is. And in fact, we lack fundamentally a data infrastructure. So we're not just, you know, people in, in, in government departments, and I chaired a committee many years ago where, where the, the public servants all thought that data was something you got from the CSO. They didn't realize that their department was sitting on the main data they needed to improve policy and make good policy. Government is now committed to a, a, data, a data strategy for every department, and I think it's hugely important that that actually comes about. It's something the CSO would be involved in. But then we've got one thing with us, uh, which is, is that to make this really useful, we have to things called unique, identifier and geo, unique identifiers and geocodes, because that's to tell us where the clusters, let's say, of poverty are, or the bad housing is, or the bad water is. It's also telling us which people are connected with different kinds of, 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 of questions across the whole society. That's a, a, a key thing that's been talked about now in Ireland for, I think, 25 years is my last count. For some reason, it hasn't happened, but to get the value of the data, it's absolutely essential. Kind of boring, kind of nerdy, kind of anarchy, but it's real. And then finally, we need, as I said already, efficient delivery, but we need to make sure it's of what we want to deliver. Now, in order to do that, and there's been a lot of focus yesterday, there was a discussion of the problem in the public sector of, of, of lack of managers. And I think, yes, there's definitely an issue, and, and Robert Watt talked about this extremely openly. Um, but ultimately, we have to address the generalist legacy that this government has inherited that's been going on for now for over 30 years of not hiring skills right across the system. Now, economists have been very much in the focus in this, but it's much more wide ranging. I mean, I list in the paper IT specialists, statisticians, urban planners, environmental specialists, project managers, lawyers and accountants. We need this whole range of skill. While the rest of society was moving on, hiring these people with all these ranges of skills, the public sector didn't do that. And in fact, it hired, it, as some of you will probably know, it, 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 it trained its IT people from the bottom, and then when they got really good, they went and they left and went off to the private sector, and the public sector had to train them all over again. So we have the challenges then of hiring new skill sets, but hiring them into a structure which doesn't have a place for them is really risky. So if you bring in the lawyers, you've got to make sure you've got something to get them focused onto. Likewise for the economists and the, and, the, and the accountants. You need a structure. If you're setting up an IT, you've got to work out how is it we're going to, we're going to actually deliver and, and do that. Where are we going to source the senior specialists in order to get it started? And how are we going to deal with the question of outward mobility? Because historically, the public sector has thought of bringing people in young, and they stay until much later on in their careers. They haven't thought about bringing them in later until, until, until very recently. To do all of this hiring of these skills means the employment control framework has to be operated intelligently. And it is a great, difficult, going to be very difficult for the government if every time they hire a skill that they need, somebody's going to bark at them either in the media or from the other side of the house because they've done something that's actually sensible to do. So I think we have to be reasonable and sensible in doing that. Right? Briefly, just on the Irish Government Economic Service, because that's the one area I know quite a bit about, this is basically government's way of building up an economic service. It's modelled on the UK. It's the idea of creating what they call government economists, which are people with highly technical skills and institutional knowledge, and it's characterised by a kind of peer learning and an apprentice learning within, within the civil service. Um, how would, how would, will ours, I've raised the question here, will our aegis, I think is what it's uh, unfortunately entitled, uh, with the second E standing for evaluation. Will it operate like the UK one? 
I have some doubts that that's going to happen quite as well. The word evaluation is in there. If evaluation means that we're suddenly going to be very positive in evaluating cost-benefit analysis of this, that, and the other, right across the system, I think that's terrific. If it means that they're going to restrict economists to doing just evaluation work, I think then we're heading then for a disaster, because it's at the design stage that very often economists can make major contributions. We need, in fact, to encompass both the civil service and the public service, which is what the UK does, and that's where you create a career path for people who are in there as government economists. Just harnessing skills within in the public service, and I think this is really a, a, a crucial thing for us, I've already touched on it, that we need to use the skill sets when we get them into best advantage. At the moment, there's a lot of people out there who don't like lawyers and accountants. They see them as people who are actually doing well no matter what happens. If the economy is up, they do well. If the economy is down, they seem to do well. But the reality is that legislation is very slow getting drafted. Is that due to a shortage of lawyers? We haven't moved over to accrual accounting. We're you know, two decades behind the UK, who were again decades behind others. We haven't done that. Is that a shortage of accountants? And are we much better off doing that? Other question, is there an open environment in government? Because I think if you're going to hold on to good people, if you're going to actually have, have people who are the drivers of change in there, is that environment open to open thinking and, 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 and reflective thinking? And I think those of us who sat listening to John Moran today would say, that's a breath of fresh air. Robert Watt yesterday, yes, that's another breath of fresh air. So I think one thing you might look to, Joe, is to see how many other breath of fresh airs you can invite up over the coming years from other departments. Finally, the issue of groupthink, I think it's just worth a mention here. And I do think that, this, that the civil service has to think about how it manages that. It's around the cultural change that, that John focused on, but it, it, is, it is very important. I'd like to make just two brief suggestions there. One is more use of peer review to look at the background papers that are being prepared for, for civil servants so that they can actually have an open view and look at the way academics do, where you critique and look and see what's wrong or what can be improved with this particular model. But the second one I want to mention is devil's advocate role. I think our system very badly needs within government departments the appointments of devil's advocates who sit at meetings, whose job is actually, and you've announced you, you're the devil's advocate today, you're at next week, you're at the week after, and your job is actually to pick holes in the arguments that are presented. That's the way of making a cultural change so that people are comfortable, not with consensus, but are comfortable with recognizing that there are criticisms out there. One minute. Uh, minimizing risk in the reform process. I know it's, we're all very keen to see change moving quickly uh, and change happening, but the reality is that it, it's, it's irresponsible to move faster than the system can manage. It is just simply irresponsible. Modern risk management would say you shouldn't do it. So I think it's important that there are 200 items identified. I think somebody needs to prioritize and say which are the ones we're going for, what's the sequence, and we must pace and sequence appropriately. I think there's a big issue for ministers that there's pressure on them for action. And once you've listed out, as in the case of the public sector reform agenda, 200 items, you're going to have any day, any, any, any individual asking, well, where's your progress on each of those 200 items? I think it was open, to, a good idea to put them out there, but there is a problem with it. There's pressure then on public servants possibly to mask the shortage of evidence. Because as I said to you, we don't have the data, so I'm not sure how we can have the evidence. And what we'd like to look forward to is a situation where actually a civil servant would say, well, look, we're not quite ready to wait that. We need in a couple of more months to actually find out what it is we should be doing by analyzing our own data to deliver. And that brings me to the point about an asymmetry in relation to the critique with regard to action. In Ireland, if you do something and you get it even slightly wrong, you're absolutely dumped on. And that it is an asymmetry there that if you don't do anything and nothing happens, you don't get blamed. And that came up a number of times at, at, at presentations yesterday, and I think it's a, real, it's a real issue. And it has to be somehow or other built into the system of rewards and structures within the civil service if that's to change. Ah, this happened again. This is just a diagram which has, looks like a piece of art, but it's not. It was supposed to show you that in the centre, which you can't see, uh, is, is, is the notion that economic recovery requires all of these pieces to come together. And as I mentioned before, I think it's very useful to, 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 to think in terms of reforms happening simultaneously. But the question really I want to raise is, why have we not had reform? A lot of discussion yesterday was delays to reform. Why do we not have reform? And I have to want to ask the question, who is the elephant in the room when it comes to inhibiting reform in Ireland? Because lots of the things that have been mentioned, I'm sure were mentioned at Joe's first ever at Lenti's event. Some of them go back to, 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 to when I was a student. I remember some of them being discussed. So who is the elephant in the room when it comes to inhibiting reform? And we can all probably have a moment of reflection now and say, who is the elephant? Who is the elephant? And we know all the competitors. I just want to say one thing. In Ireland, he or she is not alone. 